Hey guys, it's me, Carrie, and I am back with Chapter 3 of Homecoming by Cynthia Voigt. I hope you guys are enjoying this so far, because I'm really having a lot of fun recording these videos for you, and it's actually really soothing and relaxing for me, so there's something weird reflecting in my glasses. I apologize for that. I'm trying to find a better camera angle for future videos, but I haven't really mastered it yet, so I know I look crazy, but you can just listen if you want to. All right, Chapter 3. <clears throat> Daisy woke from a dream about a big white house that faced the ocean. The sun was rising over the trees behind the brook, rising in waves of molten pink. James lay sprawled on his back. Sammy was curled up. Sorry, something popped up on my stupid screen. Okay, that really took you out of it, right? Okay. Sammy was curled up into a ball, and Maybeth had thrown one of her arms over him. Daisy tiptoed off the porch and down to the brook for a quiet wash. Maybeth and James woke up immediately when she spoke their names. It's still true then, James said. Sammy moaned and turned away, burying his head under his arms. It's time to get up, Sammy, Dicey said. Tisn't, he answered, squinching his eyes closed. You all go down and wash now. I'm going to check the map. We'll eat when you're ready. Dicey tried to look at the map realistically. She considered the lines that were roads, the green patches that were parks, and the flat blue of the sound so different from the tumultuous gray-faced ocean where she had grown up. They ate half a banana apiece and finished the milk. Afterwards, they prepared to set out, but reluctantly, prepared to set out, but reluctant to leave their sanctuary, they set, sat in a row on the porch. I can read. <laughs> There's a park, maybe two or three days down the road. We'll stay there for a couple of nights, Dicey offered. She showed them where it was marked on the map, Rockland State Park, with a tent to show there was camping. We'll have a beach. We've got $3.80 left. We're going to have to think up some ways of getting money. Maybe we can find some on the ground, James suggested, if we look. Anyway, we've already got dinner for tonight. James studied the map. Where were we yesterday, he asked. Dicey showed him. Only there? We'll never get to Bridgeport. Yes, we will. We've just got to keep moving, that's all. Why? James asked. Because that's where Aunt Scylla is, Dicey said. And Mama might be there, too. What if she's not there? James asked. She will be, Sammy said. Don't say that. She knows we're going there. That's how much you know, James said. Sammy attacked James. He hurtled his little body at his brother, using his feet to kick as fast as his hands pummeled. Dicey pulled him off. Cut that out, Sammy. You hear me? Do that again and I'll whip you for sure. Sammy stood, sullen and silent. Maybeth had watched this. Mama said to do what Dicey tells us, she reminded Sammy. Anyway, it's time to go, Dicey said. She took Tam Sammy's hand and pulled him, none too gently after her. In her other hand, she carried the grocery bag that held their clothes and food. It was another hot day. The white pavement of Route 1 shimmered in the heat and in the fumes from gas and oil. The noise of traffic pounded in Dicey's ears. Her feet marched beneath her, step, 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 plodding. As repetitive, as relentless, her mind marched over the same problems. Money, food, distance, where to sleep, mama. Step, step, step. They marched, rested, marched, lunched on water and a box of stale donuts, walked, rested, and once again, on the final lap, Dicey carried Sammy on her back. They were more tired at the end of the second day than they had been the day before. They had spoken little all day. Once again, Dicey led them off Route 1 toward the water to find a place to sleep. The second night, they sheltered in a small stand of pines a few yards from the road and within sight of a big brick house. They couldn't risk a fire, so they ate the hot dogs uncooked. The one bright spot in the day had occurred in the afternoon when Sammy spied a dime on the sidewalk outside of the supermarket where Dicey bought the donuts. Added to the two pennies Maybeth and James had picked up earlier, Dicey figured they were only 21 cents out of pocket for food. That left her with $3.59. Still enough. On the morning of the third day, the sky was overcast. James awoke with his usual observation. It's still true. He was the only one with the energy to speak. The others were too hungry and thirsty. They assembled themselves quickly to return to Route 1. A breakfast of milk and bananas, 50 cents, gave them energy. As they came closer to New London and the busy Thames River... Route 1 became increasingly cluttered with restaurants, bars, quick food chains, and shopping plazas. Sammy found a quarter on the roadside. 
I'm tired of donuts, Sammy said as they approached a supermarket. What do you want then, Dicey asked. Donuts are cheap. That's why I get them. I want a hamburger and french fries. I want a Coke. Not possible, Dicey said. How about peanut butter sandwiches? We could spread the peanut butter with our fingers, and if I get a whole loaf of bread, we could have them again for dinner, so that would be okay. The younger children agreed without enthusiasm. She found a loaf of bread on sale for 15 cents and a jar of peanut butter for 71 cents. That totaled 86 cents for lunch and dinner. That would leave them with $2.48. Still enough? Dicey didn't say to herself enough for what. She couldn't have. Neither could she have said what amount of money would not be enough. Before going to the checkout line, Dicey drifted by the meat counter. Hamburger was expensive. Chicken, on the other hand, wasn't too expensive, not by the pound, but would they be able to cook it? She lingered by a package of chicken wings, which at 29 cents a pound held some interest for her. She wandered over to the fruit and vegetable counter and discovered potatoes. Potatoes were cheap. You could eat all of a potato if you could just build a fire. That night, it was in an unfinished house in a new development that they slept. Dicey picked out the house, but would not let them go into it until dark. Until then, they wandered around the maze of roads in the development, watching the children at evening play. At last it was dark, and Dicey let them return to the half-built house. Only the joists had been put in for walls, but the rough floors were down. They, lie on, they lay on plywood. Dicey gave Sammy and Maybeth the extra clothes from the bag to make pillows. Dicey lay on her back and looked up, past the roof frame to the sky. Low clouds reflected light from the ground, which blurred softly as she fell asleep. Fear of being caught woke Dicey before dawn. She knew that construction work began early in the day. It was one thing to be seen camping in the woods. That might be kids having a night out with their parents' permission. But four kids sleeping in an unfinished house? That would be police business. She woke them all at the first gray light. It's still true, James said, but he seemed to expect no response. After a skimpy breakfast of milk, they started out and soon were crossing the Thames River on a bridge that arched like a rainbow, high enough to allow huge cargo ships to travel under it. The river, seen from the height of the bridge, seemed blue and sparkling clean. They knew better, because they had seen it close up. But the look of it refreshed Dicey. It reminded her of the sea, and it reminded her that they were headed for the water. Sammy, cranky since the time he'd gotten up, had to be dragged away from the railing of the bridge. He had to be scolded every few steps to keep up. He never answered, just kept his eyes fixed to the ground. His jaw muscles worked. Dicey ground her teeth and stamped her feet in anger, still walking. Step, 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 on hard concrete sidewalks that made their feet hurt. Stop at the lights, then start again. Horns blared, engines roared. They ate lunch sitting on a bench at a bus stop on Route 1, finishing the bread and peanut butter, scooping it out with their fingers and licking it off. It was not really enough for lunch. None of them was satisfied. Dicey pushed them on to get out of the city. When the smaller, quieter beach road turned off Route 1, she told them to go on it. Immediately, even though the sky hung low and heavy with moisture, even though James protested and Maybeth's eyes glistened, even though Sammy lagged behind and her voice was hoarse with nagging at him, Dicey felt better. They were heading towards the water. At a small supermarket, she purchased two pounds of chicken wings and four potatoes. Instead of starting right off, she pulled out her map and showed the younger children where they were. It'll be less populated, she pointed out. We'll be able to have a fire, and rain began to fall in fat drops that slip flapped the ground. Dicey's heart sank. He couldn't build a fire outside in the rain. She hoped maybe the rain would stop, but she didn't think it would. She had never eaten a raw potato. She couldn't imagine eating uncooked chicken. She didn't know what to do. She urged them up and on. It's raining, Sammy said. I know that, Dicey said. It's like a bath, James said. It'll clean us off. It's cold, Sammy said. Not that bad, Dicey answered. I'm not going anywhere, Sammy said, and you can't make me anymore. You can't. Dicey's patience was at an end. She spoke bitterly. No, I can't. And maybe I don't even want to. You've been a pill all day. I'll tell you what. You don't think I'll leave you, but I will. I'll be glad to leave you behind. I know. Sammy's voice was low. So go ahead, go on, because nobody cares about me except Mama, and Mama will come find me, but she won't find you, so go ahead. All right, I will. Come on, you two. Dicey stood up and strode off. Maybeth 
excuse me, James followed hesitantly. Maybeth waited. He's been holding us up all day long, Dicey called back, and now he's doing it again. It's not fair to the rest of us. She saw Sammy bend over and pick up something. She saw Maybeth go back to Sammy and hold out her hand to the little boy. Sammy put his hand in hers and came trudging after. Dicey walked ahead of the others through a rain that resolved itself into drifting mist. It was gray, cool, chilling. She clutched a grocery bag in each hand, and then, as the brown paper grew sodden, under each arm. She didn't allow an afternoon rest, just kept moving ahead. They came to marshlands, tall grasses and cattails, shadowy in the gray afternoon. They passed bigger houses that had larger lawns. Then Dicey saw water on the right, a large inland pond. You couldn't sleep near it, though. It was surrounded by sharp-edged marsh grass that grew only on a muddy ground. However, opposite, a sign pointed to a dirt road running off into sparse piney woods. Public beach, the sign said. Dicey turned and waited for the others to catch up with her. Rain had plastered their hair down over their foreheads. Beads of moisture hung down from their eyelashes, and their faces glimmered with water. Let's go there, she said. How far is it? James asked. I don't know, Dicey answered, but it's sure to be deserted, isn't it? The growth of pines was not thick enough to do more than interfere with the rain, and the needle-carpeted ground underfoot was damp, their feet squished in their sneakers. The beach at the end of this road was backed by low, rolling dunes, which flattened out to a narrow belt of sand before giving way to the placid gray water. The four children stood atop the dunes and looked down over the empty sand. Three picnic shelters had been erected for the pleasure of the people of Noank. Three open-sided structures with shingled roofs, tables, and in each shelter a stone fireplace for cooking. It's going to be all right here, Dicey said softly. Look, Sammy said, coming up beside her. Look what I found altogether. Somebody must have had a hole in their pocket. He held out a little square hand to show Dicey a cluster of pennies and nickels. Good for you, Sammy, she said. Her relief at finding shelter and a way to build a fire had washed away the anger of the day. She smiled down at him. And look what I have for us. She pulled gently at the top of the smaller grocery bag. The bag split, but she caught it from the bottom. Chicken and potatoes. Altogether, they ran down toward the nearest shelter through the gentle rain. Halfway down the incline, Sammy tripped. He rolled the rest of the way, and not trying to stop himself, when he came to join them under the roof of the picnic shelter, he was a sight. Dicey giggled. Then she laughed helplessly. Sand coated his wet hair and face and clothing. He looked like a cookie rolled in sugar. At first, she thought Sammy was going to get angry. Even so, she couldn't stop laughing, and James and Maybeth joined in with her. But instead, Sammy smiled, threw up his arms, and executed a stiff little jig, joining in their laughter. For just that moment, he was again the little boy Dicey remembered, who loved to wrestle and tickle and never asked you to stop, who made games out of everything and anything. The younger children scoured the beach for pieces of wood. Dicey went back to the woods to get needles and dry branches of quick-burning pine. When the fire had burned down to coals, Dicey spread the potatoes out on the grate. Then they all went back down to the beach to find more driftwood. They returned with arms laden, and Dicey turned the potatoes, rinsed in raindrops, over and then arranged the chicken wings near the edge of the fire so they wouldn't scorch. Rain padded softly on the beach and water. The fire spat when chicken fat dripped onto it. Uh, here we go. The smell of cooking chicken rose faintly on the air. The four children stood watching by the stone hearth, their skin dried and their hair, and then finally their clothing. They tried to pull one of the tables over nearer to the fire, but it was bolted to the cement floor, as was every bench, so they ate in the chilly air beyond the fire's heat. The food was hot enough to warm them from within. They tried, uh, excuse me, they ate without speaking, first wolfing it down, then savoring each bite, chewing on the narrow bones, eating every scrap of potato. There was more than enough chicken. Everyone was stuffed by the time the food was gone, even James. I wish we had some butter, Sammy said. Or salt, Dicey added. Barbecue sauce is what I want, James said. And some corn on the cob and some watermelon for dessert. Or a sundae, a chocolate sundae. I wish we had that. I wish we had Mama, Maybeth said. Silence fell again. Dicey got up and put two fat pieces of wood on the fire. She sat down in front of it. James gathered up the bones, put them into the trash can, and came to sit with her. 
Sammy and Maybeth followed him. The fire glowed feverishly on their faces. While the early evening light was still adequate, Dicey spread her map out. We'll go there tomorrow, she decided quickly, pointing her finger at a green square labeled State Park. It's the one I told you about. We'll rest a day there. How does that sound to you? We've been walking for four days now. Sounds great, James said. His finger traced the red throughway markings down to Bridgeport. It's a long way, he said. Why is it all yellow there? Densely populated area, Dicey said. Like yesterday? Yeah. Where will we sleep? How should I know, James? We'll just have to worry about that when we come to it. Dicey put her hand in her pocket and took out her money. She asked Sammy to give her the money he'd shown her. He didn't want to, but he but she insisted, and he retreated to a sulky silence. They had one dollar and fifty six cents left now. Still enough. Dicey folded up the map and put it on top of a table. She went down to the water's edge and came back with a heavy rock, which she dried on her shirt and then placed on top of the map. Over the water, the air turned purple with twilight. She rejoined the others before the fire, sitting between Maybeth and Sammy. Maybeth moved closer to her and began to hum. I know an old lady who swallowed a fly, Dicey sang. I don't know why she swallowed a fly, James answered her. Dicey leaned over towards Sammy. She pointed her finger at him. Perhaps she'll die, he sang out, his eyes lighting up. They sang the whole song through until Dicey spoke the last line. She waited just long enough before saying in a solemn voice, She died, of course. Contentment blanketed them. Full bellies, the warm crackling fire, the rain pattering on the roof and falling gently on the sand pulled them together and held them close. Sometimes, Dicey remarked, I feel as if we could do just about anything, because we're the Tillermans. And I am too, Sammy said. Yes, you are, Dicey answered. James spoke quietly. Dicey, do you know where Mama is, for sure? No. Why did she go? Maybeth spoke when Dicey didn't. Mama's gotten lost. That's what I think. How could she get lost? Sammy asked. She knew where we were. Not lost from us, Maybeth said. Lost from who? Sammy asked. Not lost from anyone, Maybeth said. Just lost. But we have Dicey to take care of us. Dicey's not our mama, Sammy said. Lucky for us she isn't, James remarked. Sammy turned on him. Don't you say that. That's not nice. But it's true, James insisted. Dicey would never go off and leave us. You wouldn't, would you, Dicey? No, Dicey said. See, James asked. Mama loves me, Sammy said. You know what, James asked. We're the kind that people go off from. First our father and now Mama. I never thought of that before. What do you think, Dicey? Is there something wrong about us? I don't know, and I don't care. No, but think about it. We were always alone out there in our house. Nobody came to see us. And Mama talked differently from other people. Sort of more slow. I can't think of anybody else like us in Provincetown. Did Mama ever talk to you about our father? Did she say where he went? No, Dicey said. Do you remember him, James insisted? A little. Tell, Maybeth asked. Dicey gathered together her few memories like scattered marbles. He was tall and dark-haired with hazel eyes like Mama's. We all have eyes like theirs. James reminds me of him, and I guess I do too. You little ones look more like Mama. He had a skinny head like James and me. He had a big, loud laugh. He built our beds for us. I know that, James said. I remember him picking me up and sitting me on his shoulders. He called me his little only. I don't know why. This was vivid to her. The masculine voice crooning. The little only, only in the world, only, only. He could pick Mama up too when he was excited and swing her around in a circle. They'd sing sometimes when just the two of them were home. But most of the time he had friends who'd come to see him and Mama would take us to the beach, me and James and Maybeth. Once he brought Mama a bright red sweater and I saw her kiss him. Dicey stared into the fire, trying to piece together something from her few vague memories. He knew about cars. During the summer, he'd work as a bartender. They had fights sometimes, real fights. Is that why he left us, James asked? I don't blame him if it was, because Mama sometimes was, you know, sometimes what? Sometimes so drifty and moony, she could drive you crazy. I don't think that's why. I don't know why he left. I remember when he did, and Mama trying to explain something and crying, but she remembered more than that. She remembered that Mama was pregnant with Sammy, and that made her father angry. 
and some time after he'd gone, but before Sammy was born, two policemen had come into their house and didn't sit down but asked Mama questions, and Mama just said, I don't know, I don't know, over and over when they asked her. One of them had knelt down to ask Dicey something, but Dicey wouldn't talk to him. She just looked up at Mama and held her hand tight. So the older Dicey reasoned, reasoned her father had probably broken the law. What law? How could she know? And then he'd run away. I never had a father, Sammy declared. You did so, James answered. Everybody has a mother and a father. Not me, Sammy said. I never want to have one. Well, you can't do anything about it, James answered. We all have the same father, Maybeth said. And I don't even know his name, James said. Dicey, do you remember his name? No. But it wasn't Tillerman, James said. That's Mama's own name, not his. You know what that means, don't you? What? We're bastards. I am not, Sammy cried, leaping to his feet. I'll fight you if you say that. I'll make your nose bleed. Don't you remember, Dicey asked James, who held Sammy at arm's length? Remember what? When Maybeth was little, still a baby, there was a big party at our house. Mama wore her yellow dress with the flounces, and she had flowers in her hair. They got married right outside. There was a man in a blue suit, and they stood together in front of him and said the words. Don't you remember? James struggled to find the memory in his mind. No. No, I don't. How could he, Dicey thought, since she was making it all up. Somebody had a guitar, and Mama danced with you, and everybody watched and applauded. Maybe, James said. His eyebrows were squeezed together with the effort. But why do we still have Mama's name and not his? Because it's the best name, Dicey said. It's a good, strong name, Mama said. Is that real, Sammy asked. Dicey nodded. And we can let the fire burn all night? Sure, it'll be safe here. Sammy lay down and put his head on his forearms. I'm going to sleep now, he announced. Soon Maybeth, too, was asleep, her head in Dicey's lap. James emerged from a reverie. I didn't know they got married, he said. You never asked. I won't say it again in front of Sammy, but I don't blame him for going. Now I won't mind it as much. What does it matter, Dicey asked. It wouldn't matter to you. You always knew how to fight. You'd fight anyone who said anything to you, like Sammy does. But I can't fight. And the kids said things about Mama. Bad things about not being married. Nobody ever did to me. Nobody would dare. That was true, and the thought made Dicey proud. Would they say things to Sammy, she asked? Yeah, especially after Maybeth. I think Sammy really got it at school. Dicey fell asleep before the fire that evening, thinking of Sammy and how he must have hated to go to school every morning and then come home, and if Mama was there, she would talk to him, but less and less like a mother, and if she wasn't there, he would wonder. That could change a person. Thanks for listening, guys. That was Chapter 3, and Chapter 4 will definitely be coming soon. Please leave some comments below if you're enjoying the story. I really, really hope that you are, because it's a wonderful, wonderful book, and the the more you get into it, you, the more you're going to love these kids and love this family and root for them. And there's some big surprises to come. So I hope you're enjoying this whole story time with Carrie. I'll be back soon with more stuff. Bye, guys.